Bonnibel Bubblegum is the episode in which we find out the origin story behind Uncle Gumbald, and wow, those retcons. So much massive, fantastical retconning. But I am getting ahead of myself. The episode starts with Finn, Jake, Bonnie, and Marcy relaxing at a beautiful sparkling apple juice swimming hole. Some excellent set design. That looks like such a luxurious place to kick back. So the goblet Bimo acquired by trading away Finn's baby teeth ends up being a key item. It spurs PB's memories of her uncle, although she doesn't become aware that it's the exact same goblet until the end of the episode. We get a story of what happened like 800 years ago, after Nettie first started suckling at the roots of the infamous tree the Candy Kingdom is based around, but before we see the events with Shoko that occur in the episode The Vault. The river of mutagenic ooze was already flowing through the area, but wasn't as big of an issue back then. A young Bonnibel bubblegum rides on her yak across the wasteland, gathering scraps of technology and other items that catch her interest, and sometimes running into other beings trying to survive by whatever means available to them. The gas station where she finds the family photo and the mug that will eventually be a gift to Gumbald is actually quite the haunting premise. And I'm going to have a side video discussing this tract in more detail so as to not derail this review too much. The wasteland in general is filled with tons of human leftovers, including wreckage that looks somewhat similar to a stealth bomber that people have left graffiti and messages on. The episode does a fantastic job of establishing the atmosphere of the landscape with set pieces like these, and also establishing the kind of loneliness that plagues both the world and Bonneville herself at this current moment in time. Bonnie decides that she wants to be around others like her. She's happy Nettie can be content with just the tree roots, but desires more companionship in her own life than what can be offered by living with just Nettie. It was a lot different back in the mother gum. We all had each other's backs. This raises a whole lot of questions. For one, what happened to all those other beings that were part of the mother gum? They would eventually have split off into their own individuals as well, would they not? Did these gum people migrate across the land and not stay in contact with each other? Or on a darker note, did something tragic happen to the mother gum after Bonnie and Nettie split from it? Is that why Bonnie felt her only option was to create new gum people, rather than find and meet them out in the world? Speaking of creating gum people, did Bonnie find a bunch of regular old gum to use for the process? Or was this perhaps leftover remnants of the deceased mother gum which she brought back to reanimate? It takes an even darker edge if Bonnie created new gum relatives from the deceased husks of flesh of her real relatives. And on the subject of gum family, I have to bring up the Duke. In Princess Bubblegum's room, there are pictures of what look to be other gum people of different colors. While it's likely this is simply season 1 background decor that has since been abandoned in terms of having any importance, perhaps it is possible that at some point between this flashback and the current time, Bonnie did meet other gum people. Perhaps there was more than a single mother gum. Maybe there was an orange one and a purple one in addition to the pink one Bonnie herself spawned from. I seriously doubt we will get any solid answers to these questions. It's empty space in the lore that we will have to fill with our own hypotheses. So Bonnie creates Aunt Lolly. I could have sworn it was Aunt Molly at first, but the credits confirm it is indeed Lolly, Cousin Chicle, and Uncle Gumbald. Lolly and Chicle mostly take a backseat in this backstory, and their agency is pretty much in line with Gumball's. There's really nothing for me to comment about Aunt Lolly. As for Cousin Chicle, I love Tom Kenny, but Chicle's voice just sounds way too similar to Ice King's. I wish it was differentiated a bit more. And as for Gumbald, I have to wonder if perhaps giving him that mug right after his creation may have left a bad impression on him. Did giving him the thought that he is the greatest create a slippery slope toward a superiority complex within him? I'm gonna go out on a limb and say... probably. Bonnie did have a decent chunk of time though where she had a happy family life, as the four worked on developing their plot of land more and more. A fun detail is how the first shack had a sign with the German word Vorsicht, I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, which means caution or beware in German, indicating how Bonnie wanted others to stay away from her home. Then, prior to creating her candy relatives, the sign read Willkommen, which means welcome in German, as PB was wanting to bring new people into her life and all. And then, eventually the sign becomes Welcome to Candy Town. It's a neat little evolution. Perhaps the reason Bonnie is prone to saying words or phrases in German throughout the series is because a lot of the writing she found back in this point in time just so happened to be in German. 
So all was good for a little while, but then Uncle Gumball decides he wants to take the rein on things and be the head honcho of land development, and chops down all the taffy trees to start developing his city and his lifestyle brand. And here at this site, my great Uncle Gumball cut down all these taffy trees in a single night. Bonnie decides she'd rather not have Gumball build apartments in the area and creates a butterscotch lake so that such a feat would become impossible. I would say that the reason Bonnie undermined Gumball's plans are partially out of goodwill, but primarily based in wanting to be the one in control. While Gumball is being selfish himself, he's not consulting with Bonnie and beginning to treat her like a child who is beneath him. Bonnie's lake is also a selfish act, masked as something nice. Now instead of worrying about his dumb city, Uncle can come here to picnic, swim, and, uh, fish. Bonnie may have very well fooled herself into thinking she was doing a good deed to make her uncle's life better, but she's just exerting her own need for control. She's been taking care of Nettie since the two were born, but since Nettie does one single thing and nothing else, Bonnie is the one who's had to make all decisions and was the only one with a voice, so to say. It makes sense for her to subconsciously want to remain the person spearheading her establishment. After all, she did not create her gum relatives to be her equals. She says so herself, probably without realizing the implication. You'll be my protectors, my advisors, my family. They were meant to be her advisors. She was still supposed to remain the leader. And acting on that urge to be the leader, acting on the feeling that she knows what's best for others, that basically sets her on track to be a ruler. And at the episode's end, her place as a monarch becomes cemented. She takes on the title of princess, a word that her uncle used derisively, and owns it. I have to wonder if perhaps her self-appointed status as a princess is what led other provinces to adopt a similar princess system, as there seems to be a princess for everything in the land of Ooh. But again, I am getting ahead of myself. For now, let's discuss Gumball's scheme to rebrand Bonnie. I like how Bonnie used the Crazy for Cuties magazine as betting for Science the Rat. Clearly, she had no interest in any of that biz. Which is something Gumball should have probably realized if he just put more thought into his plans. Your schemes suck, Gumball. And thus, it turns out, Mr. Cream Puff was created by Gumbald to be Bonnie's boyfriend. Hi, babe. Beep, beep. All the candy people are like my children. Except young Mr. Cream Puff. He's like my boyfriend. Old Mr. Cream Puff? <laughs> we used to date. Oh, those sweet, sweet retcons. It's interesting how in many ways, Gumball is simply copying Bonnie. She was developing Candy Town, and he decides he wants to build his own candy city. He found out she created life, and part of his scheme against her was creating life. Peebubs is a mad scientist in many ways, and Gumball tries to be one too. He's a jealous imitator, and I'm sure if he ever realized that Bonnie created him, he would totally flip out. Did you say you made this creature? Oh, Gumbald, if you weren't so petty, you could have had a serious epiphany there. And yeah, obviously, I'm of the opinion that Gumbald doesn't realize he's a creation. So now, I think it's time to finally talk about the primary huge retcon of the episode. It turns out Manfred used to be Lolly, Crunchy used to be Chicle, and Punchy was none other than Gumbald himself. Jeez, what a way to take three minor characters we see in the very first episode of the show and completely flip the context around them. And why is it exactly that Gumbald and the others returned to their original forms? Well, remember Elements? The jelly is out of the tube! Look at those three, just standing over there, menacingly. But seriously, the three of them were made to deliberately stand next to each other, and we don't get to see the lumps revert them for obvious reasons. LSP's anti-elementification cancelled out the effects of the dum-dum juice. I see no other alternative. What happened to Chicle and Lolly, though? Perhaps Gumball disposed of them immediately after regaining his original form. Perhaps the lanky sentinel that opened the door for Bimo is actually Chicle. On the topic of Cousin Chicle, it's interesting that Crunchy has twice tried to become the ruler of the Candy Kingdom throughout the series. Once in Pajama War... Ray, Warney. Crunchy! 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 To the crater! And once at the end of the Stakes miniseries. And instead of a wax idol, they shall have a true princess. Wrought of iron, 
with teeth of diamonds. Her heart is ice. Her will is fire. Princess Crunchy the Unforgiving! This does raise questions as to whether Chicle has illusions of grandeur as well, and whether he wants to rule PB's kingdom, whereas Gumbald wants his own personalized version of PB's vision. It also raises questions as to whether Chicle might play a role in future episodes before the series comes to an end. Another thing I'm curious about is how rumors about Uncle Gumbald found their way to Banana Guard 16. Did Bonnie simply tell a simplified version of the story to the Banana Guards at some point, and they passed the information down? And finally, before this review comes to a close, we have to discuss how Princess Bubblegum chose to make Candy Citizen stupid on purpose. The Dum Dum Juice was co-opted by Peebs to create candy life that was inherently docile and simple-minded. Wow, there are just so many implications for Bonnie's character now that we know this history. Bonnie took something that was supposed to bring her demise and chose to roll with it to create an entire empire. Bonnie was extremely bitter over what happened. But they do seem happier now. So unburdened and pliable. You, the crunchy ball, dance for me! And it really feels like the bitterness she felt at this moment colored her entire outlook. Afraid of her creations turning against her, afraid of having the infighting that occurred with her first family repeat yet again, she chose to be above them all. The only citizens and family worth having are those you can control is quite the unwholesome outlook. Bonnie did try to break away from this perspective. Multiple times throughout the series, she created beings that had moderate or higher levels of intelligence, from the Rattleball Boys to Goliad. However, every time it seems like she tried to deviate, her intelligent creations proved problematic and had to be taken out of commission, reinforcing the notion that simple-minded creations were for the best. And perhaps part of the reason why the Kinabu getting more votes than her hurt her so badly is because Princess Bubblegum felt that at least if the citizens were stupid, they would not betray her. Perhaps at this moment, Bonnie felt that no matter what, her beloved creations were always destined to turn against her, which makes the moment feel even more powerful and profound than it already did. I really loved this episode. It adds an entire level of groundwork to Princess Bubblegum's personality and makes a character already rich with nuances even more layered and interesting. This was an awesome backstory.